Hey guys, it's Judy from Nutrition with Judy. Thanks for joining me today. While you're here, please make sure to like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, please make sure to leave a review as this allows my content to get in front of more people. And thank you for that. My name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition and I have a private practice where we focus on root cause healing and that often starts with the carnivore cures all meat elimination diet. Today I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Scott McMahon. He is one of the original SIRS providers and I consider him a mentor in faith-based and also in the SIRS illness. Dr. Scott McMahon is the founder of the Whole World Healthcare and he received his Bachelor of science degree in chemistry from Creighton University and completed his medical degree at Creighton University School of Medicine. He concluded his prestigious pediatric residency at Duke University Medical Center and now has his pediatrics and SERS care in New Mexico for over 25 years. Dr. McMahon has written several research papers and also several books and is focused on healing the people with the SERS protocol as well as general wellness in the pediatrics care. As you will see in this interview, Dr. McMahon is a pediatrician and he educates with humor and with fun. He is a wealth of information. He's so bright. And I love just picking his brain about life, about religion, about SIRS healing and about pediatrics. He has helped so many of our carnivore community get to healing with the SIRS protocol. He makes the SIRS protocol super simple and has followed that. And I've seen lots of healing from that. We touch on a lot of topics that people seem to struggle with on a carnivore diet. We talk about leptin resistance and how they may not be a leptin resistance issue, but how it can be related to chronic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS. We talk about low testosterone and how maybe it's that aromatase is increased on a SIRS illness and that causes low T and low DHEA and that it is not related to a carbohydrate restriction. We also talk about how our electrolyte balances, how some people just never balance their minerals on a carnivore diet. And maybe it's not the carnivore diet specifically and that you need carbs, but that maybe your osmolality and your ADH or your antidiuretic hormone that balances water retention is the core issue. We talk about a lot of these things or even sleep, how some people have issues with sleep on a carnivore diet, but maybe it's again related to that ADH marker or even our cortisol being imbalanced. We talk about a lot of these things, how if you found carnivore and you've had illness that you've been trying to support, maybe it goes beyond the diet. Maybe you've seen improvement, but maybe there is some other underlying illness such as SIRS that you may be suffering from and you're just that one step closer to getting to root cause healing. In this conversation, we talk about so much of that and even illnesses that are in children that maybe our kids are suffering from that maybe they have a persistent headache or stomach ache and we just write off as, oh, it's, they're just a young child, but maybe it's more than that. In this conversation, we talk a lot about that and it gives you a lot to think about. Let's get right into the interview. Hi, Dr. McMahon. It's so nice to uh, have you join me. And um, for the people that are listening and watching that may not know you, if you can introduce yourself. Hey, Judy, it's an honor to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, My name is Scott McMahon. I'm a medical doctor. I've been doing uh, the Shoemaker Protocol uh, for for, uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, or SIRS, for 13 years now. I've seen a couple thousand patients at this point. I've treated many people, seen hundreds of people get much, much better. I'm also a a father of eight. I'm a husband. uh, Wonderful. So wife of 13 years, um, I've been a minister, I've been a missionary, uh, I've written three books, uh, one on chess, one on spiritual warfare, and then the art and science of, uh, of servers medicine with Dr. Richie Shoemaker and Dr. Andy Heyman. Uh, I, I do, I, I see patients, I have, uh, I've written 12 or been author, co-author of 12 peer reviewed published studies, been involved in a bunch of uh, lawsuits, disability cases, workman's comp cases. Uh, I just, whatever you need, I do it. And you, you didn't mention that you're also a pediatrician. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm a pediatrician. So how did you find out about SIRS and what is SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome? 
Well, there's a spiritual answer and then there's a world answer. I'll, I'll go with the world answer unless you want to hear the spiritual answer. You can share both. Okay, well, I'll start with the spiritual answer then because it's actually what came first. I was um, I was just doing my thing. I try to live by faith. I, I've, I've been a believer in Jesus Christ for 30 years. I try to be a disciple. I try to follow him. I've you know, read through the Bible. I don't know how many times, but I really try to live like he lived. And I, I do that imperfectly on a daily basis. Um, but trying to love people and, and just be the best me that I can be. So uh, about 28 years ago, I started actually, well, actually even to hear the voice of God. And people think that's nuts. Like you can't hear the voice of God, but yeah, he says he's our father, right? And as a father, I don't just give my kids a book and say, okay, read this and learn how to live. I mean, I talk to my kids and I discipline them and, and I teach them and, and, and whatnot. And, and I believe that God, our father does the same thing. If you believe it, if you don't believe it, you probably won't hear his voice. But if you do believe that he wants to talk to you, you'll find that he's talking like all the time to us and giving us instructions and guiding us and whatnot uh, to speed the story up a little bit. I was uh, just doing my thing. I'd been asked in August if I would give a talk at a statewide medical meeting in the state of New Mexico uh, in, in January. And I said, sure. And I had spoken at the same conference the previous four years. And so they, uh, they, they were asking me like on a weekly basis and sometimes on a daily basis, because some of the people worked in the same hospital that I did, uh, you know, what's, what's the topic? What's, what's the name of your title? We have to get our continuing medical education and we have to have a title. I'm, I don't know. And I mean, I looked through the ones I'd done the last four years and I, I just, I didn't know. So I decided to do what most people do when they're out of, out of options. I prayed. I said, okay, God, what do you want me Expected a one-word answer like asthma, asthma. He doesn't speak like that. I'm just kidding. Um, and and so when I asked, this is what I heard: pediatric mold exposure colon the next great epidemic question mark. That's what I heard in my head. Now I got to tell you, mold was nowhere on my radar. I didn't even know it existed as an illness. They certainly didn't teach us about this in medical school, told us that mold really doesn't harm you. While I was in residency, we, we were starting to learn that mold can cause allergies. They taught us mold can cause asthma, can trigger asthma and whatnot. And that's about all I knew about it. So I thought, what? Mold? You got to be kidding. And I, I got to give a one hour talk on this. And, you know, with a PowerPoint, mold and i said okay whatever and i i typed an email to the people and said this is the name of my talk pediatric mold exposure colon the next great epidemic question mark and i sent it off and then i said okay i have 10 weeks to to learn about this now the physical part three weeks later somebody who comes into my office and he's got his kids there and we do their checkups and as i'm leaving um I know this man pretty well. He says, hey, Scott, can you do a favor for a friend of mine? And I said, well, who's your friend? And he said, Paul Taylor. He said, Paul Taylor, he's a local businessman, isn't he? And isn't he suing the school district because he thinks his daughter got sick because of mold at one of the schools? And he said, yeah. And so, you know, the light bulb goes on. That this is my entry point. This is where I'm going to get some information to start learning. And, and so... Uh, I met with him a couple of weeks later, and um, and a week after that, I saw my first mold patients just just over 13 years ago. And by the time that I had seen those first seven on that first night, I understood. I could see the pattern of illness, and that's how we as doctors, most of us, make diagnoses is through these pattern recognition. I could see the pattern of symptoms, and and then. This man had taken his daughter to see Dr. Shoemaker and he put me in touch with him and I talked to him and I realized this guy is brilliant and he knows stuff I, I haven't even ever thought of. And so he gave me a list of some uh, lab tests that I could do so I could objectively show that these people actually truly have an illness. And I did those on these people. And the way statistics work, 
if, if you do a bunch of tests on a bunch of healthy people, on average, two and a half percent of the results will be low and two and a half percent will be high and 95% will be in the normal range. Right. But when I did these lab tests on these people, and we're talking 14, 15, 18, 20 year olds, and one person uh, just short of 50. When we did these lab tests, we found that 58% came out abnormal. Wow. 58%. Well, that's certainly significant. And then I shared my de-identified data with Dr. Shoemaker, and he compared it to a number of his other cohorts. And he saw that we had the same number of abnormal lab tests, the same number of systems involved, the same number of uh, symptoms. And it just confirmed that these people had chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Now, it wasn't called that then. It wasn't called that for about until about six months later. But they had this illness that I didn't even know existed. And unfortunately, a lot of doctors still don't know it exists. What exactly is SIRS? Maybe some of those symptoms, like what is SIRS? So if you think about the human body, we're a lot of water, a lot of chemicals, um, some connective tissue that holds us together. I mean, we really should just be a sack of chemicals all reacting with each other, but we're not. Okay. And the reason why we're not is because we have all these different situations in our body. We regulate how much fluid we have and we regulate how fast our heart beats and, and what our blood pressure is to make sure that the blood can go where it needs to go. And, and, and a number, I mean, there are hundreds of different kinds of little fine tuning and, and others that are more coarse tuning on, on how this body runs. So regulation is the key. And, and there's even regulation of the regulators. And there's regulation of the regulation of the regulators. And it all goes back to our DNA. And there's even maybe a fourth level of regulation. I mean, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and as doctors, we know a lot about how this body works. And there's a whole lot that we're discovering every day because we don't know everything. Well, the immune system is one of those systems that helps regulate. The primary job of your immune system is to recognize when foreign things come into your body that could potentially harm your body, could even cause an infection or an allergic kind of reaction or whatever, a toxicity. And when your body recognizes the foreign, it goes out of its way to, to destroy that. Now, the, the chemicals that it uses to destroy that are called cytokines. C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E-S. And when you have uh, an illness like say the flu, your body ramps up the production of cytokines to fight off those flu virus particles. The problem is that those cytokines, when they're overproduction, uh, they cause, they actually cause the symptoms of the flu. Mm -hmm. And the flu virus itself doesn't really cause a lot other than the triggering of the release of all these cytokines, which then cause your fevers and your chills and your headache and your body aches. That's, I'm sorry, and your body aches. I have to learn how to count. I'm sorry, Judy. Um, and, and all the other symptoms that you're getting from the flu come from the cytokines. But once your body gets on top of that flu virus and, and you've eradicated all the particles that are telling your body that there's a foreign invader there, once you get rid of that, your immune system has been ramped up and these cytokines are being overproduced. At that point, you release large amounts of a chemical called VIP, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, and MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. And they bring those cytokines back down to normal. Now, all that time that your cytokines were ramped up, you know, during the course of a flu, that might be a week, that might be two weeks, okay? All that time, your body is inflamed because if inflammation and the function of the immune system go hand in hand. But when VIP and MSH bring everything back down to normal, you reverse that and you get rid of the inflammation. So that's the, that's the understanding you have to, you have to have to know what SIRS is. SIRS happens when you get constantly bombarded with a foreign antigen that may be alive, like a mold spore or a bacteria, or it may be dead. It may be the fragment of an old dead mold. And it's, it's um, a cell wall has broken apart into hundreds of pieces. 
and you breathe that in and it goes into your lungs and your body recognizes it immediately as being foreign. And your body doesn't tell the difference between a spore that's alive or a bacterium or an actinomycete. It doesn't know the difference between that and the fragment. It just recognizes a chemical sequence on that fragment or on the cell wall of the bad guy and it starts that immune process. Now, in the normal immune process, once you've been exposed to something, once you make antibodies to it, all of our patients who have this illness have a genetic predisposition in what's called the HLA or human leukocyte antigen portion of chromosome six. And that is the, the part of your immune system that determines what antibody you're gonna to make to what antigen. And so if you make crummy antibody or you don't make any antibody at all, then what happens is if you have chronic exposure, you keep breathing it in, breathing it in because it's in your house or your workplace or the school that you go to and you breathe it in for hours a day, multiple days a week and you keep breathing it in, you keep triggering your immune system, you keep ramping it up, the, the uh, antibody portion of your immune system can't come in and take care of it like it usually does after a second or, or uh, further exposure. And so your innate immune system just continues to ramp up all the time, which means you're in inflammation all the time. Now, initially, you probably make additional VIP and MSH to keep fighting and pushing the, the immune system back down, and you don't have a lot of symptoms. But eventually what happens is either your ability to make VIP or MSH or both break. And we see that MSH is low in 93% plus of our patients, VIP in almost three quarters of our patients. And so now you don't have the VIP and MSH to push back and to bring everything back to normal. And even if you get rid of your exposure, like you go to a different school or you get a different job or you fix your house or move and you're not getting that exposure anymore, even though you are, you stay ramped up because you don't have VIP and or MSH to bring you back down. Your immune system is now broken and we call that chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Now, once the immune system is broken, it causes a breakdown in regulation in other parts of your body like the blood flow to your hands and feet and even to your brain. And so you get underperformance or poor performance from those kind of areas. You get cold hands, cold feet. Maybe you even get like brain fog okay? because you're not getting adequate amounts of oxygen and blood to your brain to cause it to function properly. And other things can happen. You can get mold toxins in your body and they may have uh, effects, for instance, on, on your nervous system, cause you to have weird symptoms like vertigo or numbness or tingling or burning pains or other kind of neuropathic pains. Uh, you have abnormalities in what's called brain barrier. You're, mm, I don't want to get too technical here. I know you can handle it, but I know that you have maybe some people who don't have scientific background to understand, but most of your body most of your blood vessels in your body are not like garden hoses where the water goes in one end and it comes out the other, the other end. Most of your blood vessels in your body are like soaker hoses. They're like a, 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 a garden hose that you've taken a pin and you've made multiple pokes in it. So little bits of the blood flow out of your blood vessels and into the tissues in your body. That, that's just standard stuff. That's one of the ways that you can get edema if too much of that is coming out. That's one of the reasons you have a lymph system to clean all that up. But in your brain, your brain has very, very sensitive tissue and it doesn't want stuff just oozing into it out of the bloodstream. So by the fifth day of life, by the time a baby is five, the blood vessels that go to feed the brain and the brain cells grow into those blood vessels and intercalate themselves. And they create a lining that doesn't allow that just normal diffusion of stuff out of the blood vessel into the meat of the brain, what we call the parenchyma. So we call that extra lining where the, the nerve cells from the brain and the blood vessel lining come together. We call that the blood brain barrier. 
And the very effective at keeping chemicals and toxins and things out of the brain. Super important. So important that it grows by five days of life. But certain chemicals like VIP and MSH and vascular endothelial growth factor are necessary to maintain the integrity of that blood brain barrier. Blood brain barrier is kind of like a Ziploc bag. It just keeps a bunch of junk from oozing out of the bag into wherever. But if you have low VIP, low VEGF, or particular, or, and also possibly low MSH, which are the hallmarks of SIRS, then you, you can start getting. On top of that, the cytokines that we look at to see if you have SIRS, C4A, TGF beta 1 or human transforming growth factor beta 1 type, MMP9, the matrix metalloproteinase number 9, when those are elevated, they actually degrade the blood brain barrier. So if this is the blood brain barrier, and these are cells that are, you know, touching each other and making that Ziploc bag. When you have low VIP or MSH or VEGF, you're starting to kind of breach. And if you've also got high levels of C4A or MMP9 or whatnot, you start getting breaches in that blood brain barrier. And now stuff can, and that can cause all sorts of problems in the brain. I, I think, let me take a step back. Most people will think, Okay, I get that mold will cause these issues. Um, some of these markers that most people don't know of, they can go and get them tested at LabCorp and Quest and all those labs. But a lot of people think, well, if I leave the musty building or the buildings that show the black mold, then I'll be okay. And some people will go to those homes and they start to feel a little better. Why is it that, and I know you brought up the HLA, but maybe if we can expand on that, but why is it that some people, once the immune system is broken, that their body cannot fix it on their own, even if they're mostly out of exposure? So there's a continuum of illness. And if you have an HLA abnormality, you're actually born with it. But, I've, you know, as a pediatrician, I've never seen a child brand new who was having headaches. Of course, I'm not sure how they tell me that. But, you know, I, the, the youngest that I've ever seen anyone with the illness is probably about 14 months old. And most of the children that I've first seen are like four or five years old. And they usually have one simple problem, like, like headaches, or the, they'll have recurrent stomach issues where their stomach bothers and they don't want to eat, or they'll have, they'll be couch potatoes and they'll just sit on the couch all the time and they don't want to be active, or they'll have recurrent muscle aches, what we call growing pains, which we really have as pediatricians, we have no idea what causes growing pains. To be honest, we have no idea what causes chronic headaches in children, okay. except for maybe 10% of them. We have no idea what causes chronic stomach aches in children. We, we say that it's, as, as pediatricians, we say it's stress or stressors from school or from the home life. And it's causing the brain to basically synthesize this kind of pain, maybe even as a cry of help or something like that. But what I found is when you look at at the, the children who have chronic headaches or chronic stomach aches or chronic fatigue, and you do the, the biomarkers of SIRS, 90% of them will have abnormal biomarkers. So this really is the answer for the vast majority of kids who have chronic headaches or chronic stomach problems or chronic fatigue or the muscle aches. And when you treat them, those go away. So for those kids, let's say the home was the one uh, part or the school that was making them sick. If they remove themselves from those buildings, my understanding with the genetic type, with the SIRS diagnosis is that they will not get better even with the removal of those buildings. Right, so, so that's kind of like allergies. You know, if you have an allergy to a cat and you're visiting someone who has a cat, your allergies leave and you're no longer being exposed to the cat, then your allergies get better. That's a common understanding in medicine. Right. Uh, but the problem with SIRS is that VIP and MSH patient that I've ever seen that was diagnosed with SIRS has either a low level of VIP or a low level of MSH or both. And you have a continuum. And that's what I started to talk about. You have this continuum. You're born with a genetic predisposition. You get multiple hits through life, maybe from your school, maybe at church, and then at or your best friend's house that you go and play at every day. And then at some point, you go like this. 
and your symptoms and everything just go out of control. I think what happens at that point, and I can't prove it yet, but I think what happens when you go from this kind of low level to this high level is that to make VIP M or MSH, that, that it's that point that it's broken. So that's the understanding necessary to understand the answer to the question. And that is you don't have the VIP and MSH to bring your immune system back down to normal. So even though you are no longer in that bad building, you are unable to quell the immune system. The other part of that is that you've been inhaling stuff. Maybe it's toxins, maybe it's other kinds of in inflammations, things that cause inflammation, things that trigger the immune system. Because if you trigger the immune system, you trigger the inflammation. So anything that your body takes in that's foreign that you don't have antibody to, if that's still roaming around in your body, whether it's in your bloodstream or your gut or anywhere where the immune system is active, if you still have that in your body, you are still triggering the, the immune response. So you've got two things. You're, even though you're not doing it from, from your environment anymore, and you no longer have VIP or MSH to bring everything back down to normal. And so that's why they continue to be ill. Don't always see that in like five, six year olds. But again, that continuum of illness as you get older and as you get to that inflection point where you start getting really sick, uh, you definitely will have that. And then I know you did a study relating to PANS and SIRS. Can you talk a little bit about that study and how maybe a lot of these childhood illnesses may actually be related to SIRS? Well, we, we know that a lot of in adults and children are related to inflammation. And that, that is, that's the new trend is looking at inflammation. Most doctors only look at inflammation from the side of the adaptive immune system where antibodies is, is, is made. That's all of rheumatology is looking at autoantibodies that you're making or eating up your body, lupus and uh, dermatomyositis and rheumatoid arthritis and, and the like. This is inflammation that's coming from the innate immune system, which is something that a lot of physicians are, or many physicians are, are not aware of at this point. So as, as we're looking at diseases like PANS and PANDAS, you know, we have to keep in mind that, that inflammation may be a part of the problem. So PANS is the pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric illness. PANDAS is a more... Um, a more tightened form of that that's caused by exposure to, to group A beta hemolytic strep. It's the pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infection or like strep throats or okay. other streptococcal infections. And for those in your audience who don't know about PANS and PANDAS, take a perfectly normal child and they get ill with a virus or strep throat or, or some other illness. It doesn't have to be viral or bacterial, um, and they become nuts over two to three days. They start having rage reactions, sometimes psychotic reactions. And that's not a nice way to say it. I don't mean that in any kind of negative way for people who have kids with pans and panis, but more just for people that have never seen it, never heard of it to understand is your child loses their sweet, wonderful disposition and, and becomes psychotic at times or close to psychotic. It's a really scary time. Sometimes they'll have tics. Sometimes they'll have seizures and they've never had those before. And then as the illness wanes over two or three days, the behaviors will wane over two to three days also, but they may not go away. You may stay with the baseline of those. And then if a month later you get another cold or flu or virus or whatever, or another strep throat, if it's pandas, then everything comes back again within two to three days and you just go on the cycle and it's a really awful disease. So the study that I did with Dr. Shoemaker and Jennifer Smith and, and Dr. Jimmy Ryan, Jennifer Smith's a doctor too. Um, we looked at 39 children who had been previously diagnosed outside our clinics with either PANS or PANDAS. And we took the most strict criteria that were available at the time called uh, the, the Stanford criteria, Stanford consensus criteria from, from 2013. And we, we, we applied all that to all 30, 39 of the kids. We found that 33 of the kids met the criteria and could be called pants, pants. The other six didn't. So we excluded them from the study. And then what we did was check the biomarkers that we use in SIRS 
on these 33 children because there are no biomarkers for this illness. There's no lab test that says you have PANS or PANS. There are some that purport to be that, but they haven't been validated yet. Anyway, so we did our routine tests on these kids and we found that they averaged in the younger kids, they, are, and they had at least four abnormalities and in the older kids, at least five, which meets the diagnostic criteria for SIRS. So to, to put that in another way, every single one of these children that had uh, PANS or PANDAS previously diagnosed correctly also had chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Every single one, 33 out of 33. You don't see 100% in medicine very often. Right. So then we treated them, okay, as we would treat somebody who had SIRS. And, and the background on that is there's a whole bunch of different kinds of treatments. There's, you know, penicillin prophylaxis, so you don't get a strep throat. There's uh, uh, IV, IG therapies, which is incredibly invasive and expensive. There are uh, a whole host of SSRIs for children with cognitive behavioral therapy, like it's all in your head. You know, there are all sorts of these therapies and none of them at the time we did our study was even 50% effective, not a single one, not one. When we treated our children with this, we found that 94% of their, um, of their symptoms that would, would cause them to get a diagnosis of pans or pandas went away. Wow. We found that 94% of their SIRS symptoms also went away. And there is a significant amount of overlap between the two. And we found that 75% uh, of their neurobehavioral issues, their rage reactions, their tics, their seizures uh, and the like, their uh, food preferences, changes and things like that, 75% went away. We had 19 kids that were on penicillin prophylaxis. We took them all off their penicillin prophylaxis. And at six months, not a single one of them had had recurrence of their pans or pants. Wow. And so what we found was that this was an incredibly effective way of evaluating and treating kids that had pans or pans. One might ask the question there, you know, is, is pans or pants a subset of of chronic inflammatory response syndrome? And the answer I would say is it probably isn't. It might be, but it probably isn't. What I think more is happening is that when someone gets PANS and PANDAS, they create some abnormalities in the immune system in their body, but because of the blood brain. And so we don't see what's happening with PANS and PANDAS. But chronic inflammatory response syndrome, as I already described, it can create breaches in the blood brain barrier. And now those abnormalities in the immune system created by this viral or bacterial illness or whatever, now they can get into the brain and they can start causing inflammation in the brain. There are studies that show that if you have inflammation in the body, regardless of the cause of the inflammation in the body, whether it's TH1, TH2, TH17, for those of you who like the science, it doesn't matter what it comes from. Right? If you get holes or breaches in the blood brain barrier, then some of those cytokines will get into the brain and they will cause low level inflammation in the brain, in the meat of the brain. We call that encephalitis right? or an encephalopathy. Fortunately, it's low level. So the, the, the technical term that we actually use is, it's not technical, I'm kidding. It's called brain fog. You know, brain fog is a combination of loss of executive function and memory and, and uh, the ability to focus and concentrate on a task. And that's what we see in people that have stirs. But how much is brain fog? You know, I hear a lot of the excuse of, oh, I had a lot of carbs and that's why I have brain fog. Or it's just a part of age. As I'm aging, I'm losing some of my executive function or memory or I, I forget where I left my keys. How much of that is illness and how much of that is aging, would you say? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think that if you believe as you get older, you're going to lose function, you will. Right. Okay. I personally don't believe in old age. I, I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't believe in it. I don't buy it. I, I think we curse ourselves when we talk about how, you know, oh, I'm 45, I'm losing my brain. I don't do that. I never have done that. And I'm, I'm 60 and I feel great. And I've got more 
well, I won't say more energy. I've got as much energy as I had when I was in my 20s. And I thank God for that. But I, I don't I don't believe in those kind of things. And I don't think people should speak, you know, that kind of stuff over themselves. Uh, and that that, you know, that goes to attitude, too. I mean, I, I always have the attitude that I'm going to come out of something, even if I don't win, that I'm going to come out better. I I, I usually believe I'm going to win. Even if I don't win, I'm going to overcome that. I mean, that's just the mindset that I set. So I think that service can definitely cause brain fog and it can do it even in small children. I've, I've okay. seen that. I've seen when we, when we corrected the situation and treated them for service, I, I, I've seen it going. I've seen a seven-year-old who was the top of his class. His family moved into a house that was previously water damaged, but they didn't know it. The majority of the water damage came from work that they did outside, stucco that had broken, pressure washing. And so the mall was inside the exterior wall. Oh, okay. She couldn't see it from his bedroom, but it was around the child's bedroom. He went over about a six month period from being the top of his class to being put into special remedial classes. Wow. And then he was treated and he, within six months, he came right back up. I have another patient who was uh, five, four or five years old when Hurricane Sandy came, her apartment flooded. And again, within six months, she had gone from being, you know, close mi middle to top of the class to being considered by a neuropsychologist as autistic, frank autistic, not high end, low end of the autism spectrum. And her mom got in touch with me. We ended up treating her. Within six months, she was back into regular classes with a mild speech deficit. So this clearly can cause problems in, in children and it can cause problems in adults. Much easier to clear up in children. Adults tend to have been exposed for many, many more years. And they because there's not a lot of awareness about this yet, they tend to have a longer delay in the time before they find the right doctor. It's not unusual for me to see patients who have seen 30 doctors. They've been to the Mayo Clinic, they've been to the Cleveland Clinic, and no one recognized what they had. And, and I know in five minutes what they right, have, right. which I, I, mean, I gotta say, that's kind of a, an ego boost. Um, and our treatment is very successful. But yeah, the brain fog, I think, primarily comes from, um, uh, from the illness. There are other things that can contribute, head injuries, mm -hmm. you know, TBIs and things like that could potentially, uh, and other neurologic illnesses could potentially contribute. But I think, I think for most of my patients, the vast majority of it is the SERS and not aging um, and not any other factors. I had a client that went to all the top hospitals. I think it was Johns Hopkins where they finally diagnosed her with an undiagnosable autoimmune illness. And as she told me her story, I had her test for SERS and she was positive. And it was a 10 year, 20 year long journey. And it's so frequent that I see this as well. And once you learn about SERS and all the symptomologies and the history, even not in the actual criteria that Dr. Shoemaker made, one common factor I see is autoimmune offline off the record, some of the SERS providers say you may find that 95% of people struggling with autoimmune actually are struggling from SERS. What is your thoughts on autoimmune and chronic inflammatory response syndrome? I haven't seen it that high, but I would say people that have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, I think probably at least 30 to 40% of them have SERS and maybe okay. higher. Um, I, I've seen it with with rheumatoid arthritis, I've seen it with lupus. I've seen it misdiagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis, <laughs> lupus multiple, multiple right. times. You know, I, I just just follow the strict criteria of of the diagnostic criteria for lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, and you see that they don't meet that, and then they do meet the criteria for SERS, and you train them for SERS, and they get much, much better. I've also seen people that had both illnesses, and when you treat them for SERS, their other illness doesn't go away, but it gets much better because we're talking about an immune system. And those kind of rheumatic illnesses are on the adaptive immune system side, and SERS is on the, the uh, innate immune system side. 
but it's not like a refrigerator and a freezer that have totally separate circuits. They're completely detached from each other. The immune system has lots of interactions between the two sides. And innate and adaptive are really just man-made um, uh, labels that we've been to try and make it a little less complex. And there are interactions we don't even know about yet that we will discover in the next 5, 10, 20 years. So certainly, if you have an illness that's autoimmune, like SIRS is, okay, although it doesn't make autoantibodies, except ACLA and AGA, but that's another story, NA and A. Um, if, you, if you fix one part of the immune system, it's got to help another part of the immune system. Either way. That makes sense. What about low testosterone, low cortisol? I mean, we hear so much, oh, y- your life is so stressful or your work or maybe even your diet is releasing so much excess cortisol and now your cortisol is so broken that now you have low functioning cortisol in the morning. But I also see that as a very common <laughs> symptom of SIRS. Absolutely. So regarding cortisol, when you have a broken MSH, as 93.2% of our patients do, that's that's the conservative number, by the way. In Dr. Shoemaker's data, it's even higher. When you have when you have broken MSH, that breaks the communication between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And I didn't mention the hypothalamus before because we were getting pretty technical. But the hypothalamus is kind of in the middle of your of your skull and it is just underneath the brain but it's still pretty central it takes inputs from all over the brain and the brain takes inputs from all over the body so literally the hypothalamus is getting inputs from all over the body and it is making decisions about what the body needs it is the main regulation center of your entire body. And I mentioned before that this is a disease really of regulation. Starts out with dysregulation of the immune system, leads to dysregulation of other things. So your hypothalamus becomes dysregulated also. One of the prime ways the hypothalamus communicates with the pituitary, the pituitary being the master gland, the pituitary being the control over the majority of the hormone system or the endocrine system of your body. When the, when the hypothalamus can't tell it what to do, the pituitary is just like blind. It's like blind leading the blind. And when you cut out the ability to communicate through MSH to the hypothalamus, you don't secrete chemicals like antidiuretic hormone or uh, adrenal corticotrophic hormone, ACTH in proper amounts. ACTH is the chemical that goes down to your adrenal gland and regulates how much cortisol you're making. So if you have dysregulation in that system, as well over half of our patients do, then you can expect that your cortisol levels are going to be too high or too low and that your ACTH response will be totally messed up. It's, it, and then the other uh, one that you talked about is testosterone. Testosterone takes uh, comes from the testicles in men and the ovaries in women, but they also get their orders from the pituitary that get their orders from the, the, uh, the hypothalamus. And in addition to that, testosterone can be converted into estrogen back and forth. And the chemical that converts testosterone into estrogen is aromatase. And aromatase is upregulated in patients that have SIRS. So if you're a man, and you're you're low T at the time, you may be low T because you're high aromatase and it's causing you to funnel much of your testosterone into estrogen, which will start giving you the characteristics of women, which for most men is not what they want. In those guys, if you take you know tea, shots of tea or if you're taking other forms of tea, pellets or whatever, it's just going to take the extra testosterone that you're putting into your body and converting it into more estrogen. So you really have to figure out what the problem is first. What's interesting is there's um, carnivores, which I think that a lot of people will turn to carnivore or this extreme all meat diet because everything else is not working and they're not well. And on the diet, some people will notice, well, a lot of people that one of the concerns of a all meat diet is uh, potentially reducing your testosterone. And so they think it's because, oh, I have a lack of carbs, but I wonder 
right? That they're sick enough that they're willing to try a carnivore diet. And then they just find out that they also have low testosterone. How much of that is SIRS and not that they're having a lack of carbs. And you see it also with women uh, with low DHEA or even low thyroid function. And they blame the lack of a macronutrient rather than I think that that may be a sign that you're actually suffering from SIRS and not just a dietary change. I, I absolutely agree with you, Judy. I, I think it's related to the illness and, and not the diet. So I, I do see for women that their testosterone will be low. What's interesting, I had one client, we share that same patient. Um, she had low testosterone and I didn't think she fit the bill for, for SIRS, but she has been chasing health in all different ways. And maybe it was her leptin, but she couldn't manage her weight that well, unless she really cut calories because of the imbalance of testosterone, no matter what she did, whether it was high fat, um, lots of things, she decided to test because her doctor was saying, you need to start taking testosterone. And she just didn't want to. And lo and behold, she had one of the genetic types and she has hers and she's healing with you. What is it about leptin too? Because once she started going on the SIRS protocol, she finally lost some of the weight or a good amount of weight that she had gained on carnivore. Yeah, so, so leptin is an appetite hormone along with ghrelin and, and the like, and, and they stimulate you to eat more. Without getting too complicated in the biochemistry, when you're not making enough MSH, your body wants you to make more MSH. And the way you trigger that is by triggering the leptin pathway. The enzyme that's coming to trigger a particular receptor, we talk about like a, a, a lock and key. The enzyme is the key and the receptor is a lock. And when it fits in properly, it turns it and it causes it to do something, to release some chemical, to start some pathway or whatnot. What we find is that when your body wants more MSH, it wants to trigger that leptin pathway, but the leptin pathway can get blocked by some of these cytokines. Okay. Now you'll release leptin, but you won't trigger the pro opio melanocortin pathway, also called the POMC. And in the pro opio melanocortin pathway, you release alpha MSH, which is what we want. You also release ACTH. They're made in that same molecule. And so you'll make more and more and more of that leptin to try and get in there to trigger the leptin receptor because a number of the doorways are blocked. And so you keep making leptin, trying to force your way into that blocked doorway. Mm -hmm. And as you make the more leptin, then you increase your appetite and you, and you change the way you metabolize the food too. And so what we find is people that have low levels of MSH and high levels of, of leptin, they don't lose weight using right. diet and exercise. And, and I've seen huge gym rats. They, they can't lose the weight and testosterone may be a part of that too, sure. but until you can convert that now, how do you convert that? How do you get, you know, the leptin down? Well, you have to get rid of the inflammation because it's the inflammation making the cytokines that block the leptin receptor that allow you to not make the MSH that cause you to keep making more leptin to try and get into that leptin receptor. Yeah, there's um, lately there's been this fad going on about do a leptin resistant diet. And so maybe it's the, the frequency of meals and a lot of other things. And I'm sure there's some validity to that in terms of like the circadian rhythm of eating. But I think the root cause is not a leptin resistance issue. It's what you said. Um, it's why is leptin being triggered? Right. And maybe it's a low MSH. And I always say, just test your MSH. You can go to a lab core and even test that marker. And if it's low, that doesn't mean you have SIRS yet, but that's a good indication of it. Another one that a lot of carnivores complain about is for some reason, I cannot, uh, balance my electrolytes and until I eat carbs, I don't, I cannot regulate that balance. But the other thing is I always see antidiuretic hormone imbalanced in a lot of our patients. And so it's not an electrolyte thing. It's actually that their hormones are not balancing that. If you could talk a little bit about antidiuretic hormone and what's the other marker that goes with ADH? I'm forgetting, but it's not vasopressin. Quality. Okay. That's right. That's right. Osmolality. Okay. So you nailed it. It's, it's an MSH problem. And you know, when you look at Dr. Shoemaker's uh, biotoxin pathways. Thank you. MSH is in the very center of it. Yes. And most of the symptoms are triggered by low levels of MSH. So here's another one. The, the, the MSH is supposed to be made in 
the hypothalamus or an extension of the hypothalamus that makes up the posterior part of the, the pituitary or in between, what they call the pars intermedia. But anyway, so MSH gets made there and it gets transported through the portal system to, uh, to the pituitary gland and it, it regulates the, the release of ADH, which is anti-diuretic hormone. The, the job of ADH is to go from the pituitary down to the kidney and say, hey, stop making urine. In fact, when you learn to potty train as a wee one, what you're actually doing is, is you're triggering your brain at nighttime to make more antidiuretic hormone. So you make less urine. You still make some when you get up in the morning. You, and then during the day, you start decreasing it. Well, antidiuretic hormone is the prime uh, a chemical that dictates your fluid balance in your body. And most of our SERS patients are significantly dehydrated. At least 85% of our patients either have an antidiuretic hormone that's too high, that's too low, or is not proper for the serum osmolality that is measured at the same time. Serum osmolality is actually a measure of the fluid in your blood and how much salt is in there and how much fluid is in there and it, it gives you kind of a ratio of that. So there's certainly, there's a normal range. And then as you're getting dehydrated, your serum osmolality rises. And as you're getting waterlogged, it goes down. And, and there's a pretty tight range that your body tries to keep that in. What we find in most of our patients is that their serum osmolality is high. They're running toward the dehydrated side and their antidiuretic hormone is running low. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. If your osmolality is high, your antidiuretic hormone is supposed to be high. If your osmolality is low, your antidiuretic hormone is supposed to be toward the low end. But that's not what we have. We have this loss of regulation of the fluid balance. And when you have loss of regulation of the fluid balance, particularly when you're on the dehydrated side, you drink and drink and drink. So a lot of our people you know, are always carrying their own water or water bottles. You won't ever see them without it. And then as a result of that, because they're not making antidiuretic hormone, they can't keep it in them. Right, right. They just pee it right out like a racehorse because it's the antidiuretic hormone that they're not making that is what keeps the fluid in your body, keeps your kidney from peeing it out. So they, they run fluid balance problems and they get headaches. Um, they will get sometimes these like static shocks you know, that when they touch all the time, I've had people who were in bare feet on wood floors that would get shocking as they walked wow. along the wood floor. So it's not necessarily static clang or whatever. What I have found is a lot of the carnivores, first, they think it's blood sugar imbalance that they're waking up in the middle of the night. And then what happens is they'll wake up four times a night and it's actually because their ADH is imbalanced. And so they will try to regulate, oh no, if I just stop drinking water at a certain time at night, then I won't wake up as much. But what I'm finding is no, once people regulate the MSH or go through the shoemaker protocol, and then they're balancing ADH, they don't wake up as much to use the restroom. And it, it's, I just find it interesting that people blame the diets or some component of the diet, but it's actually, no, you're actually getting closer to root cause. Now you're realizing it's less noise from the diet itself. And you can actually figure out maybe I'm suffering from SIRS, which I do think a large portion of carnivore is suffering from question for you is, I mean, you've now seen several of the people that I've sent over to you and just um, being in the SIRS community in general, what are some benefits of being a carnivore eating mostly meat and with the SIRS diagnosis? I, I don't think there are any benefits. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, 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 you know, I, as you know, I've, I've tried the carnivore diet. 18 pounds in two months, which, you know, weight has been an issue of mine since I was a child. Uh, I, I think there's, there's two real obvious ones. One is the weight loss. Yeah. Uh, well, the, I guess there's a third one. I really like meat. <laughs> and so it's, it's what I like vegetables too. And I found myself craving blueberries, you know, that first mm -hmm. week or two, because I, I love fruit. I love vegetables. I, I love meat. Um, I love bacon for dessert. Um, the, the third one is that it's a, it's a relatively low glycemic diet. Right. And you know, MMP9, which I mentioned before, is the matrix metalloproteinase number nine. MMP9 is a chemical that's made inside cells. 
and the cytokines are made inside cells. But the body will cause, the, the body ha has these ways of talking to itself that we're starting to discover. One thing that will happen is the MMP9 will basically put one of these cytokines in its trunk. You know, assume it's like it's like a Chevy pickup or something like that. It'll put it in its trunk, well, I guess in its bed, and it'll burrow its way out of the cell through the cell membrane. It'll get into the bloodstream and take that cytokine to some other place where it's been told to go. And then it'll drop that chemical off. Um, and, and as it drops the chemical off, that cytokine then either benefits the body in the inflammatory response, or it causes SIRS. One of the things that we see in, in SIRS is that there's too much MMP9, which means there's too much in the way of cytokines. And if we can regulate that and how much MMP9 is being made, then we don't get as much of the transport of those bad cytokines because we're making too many uh, to the places where they're going to do the damage. So, so carnivore is kind of a perfect diet to be able to kind of regulate MMP9. That in addition to omega-3s at high dose, which also help turn off the production of MMP9. Is there any other reason for the low amylose diet, which is like a low sugar diet that Shoemaker recommends other than the MMP9? That, to my knowledge, that's, that's the only reason. We, we do that in people who have um, elevated MMP9 because we want to bring it back down to normal. We also do that uh, at the beginning with cholesterol. Sometimes it can trigger an intensification reaction. So people that are pretty sensitive, sometimes we'll do that that combination of the no amylose diet and the omega threes um, for like 10 days as a run in to, to start the cholesterol to pry and prevent the intensification by preventing the, the overproduction of MMP nine during that time. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the binder. So, you know, what's fascinating to me is cholestyramine, the intended use is to reduce cholesterol. And for a carnivore diet, it seems perfect because we eat lots of saturated fats that our cholesterol will already be high. So there's some to take away from in a sense, whether that's good or bad, but for people, and I know that there's SIRS patients that are vegans, how are they toler? I've always been curious of this, but how are they tolerating cholestyramine and wall call that's reducing cholesterol? And I think they are already at a lower, if not deficit in cholesterol and within their body. I, I, I think that can be a real problem and, okay. and one that we don't see with people who are carnivores. The idea behind cholesterol and, and well call and other binders is that as they go through the gut, that they're going to bind on to toxins or, right. or other um, molecules that are in the body that are actually triggering the immune response. And by the way, when people talk about toxins, keep in mind that your body recognizes biological toxins as uh, foreign bodies as, as, as inflammatory. So they trigger the immune system too. So if you can get those out of your body, uh, the toxins and other, other parts, of uh, maybe, maybe there's some, uh, some uh, naked DNA of, okay. of a bacteria or, well, it's usually RNA, but uh, RNA or DNA products there that are triggering your body to say, oh, there's something foreign or other molecules like beta glucans and whatnot. When your body sees those, they trigger the immune response. If you can get those out of your body, then that's great. I believe the way cholesterol works is, is it goes into the gut, it finds negatively charged ions and it binds onto them, grabs onto them, takes them out in your stool. And that'll lower the concentration in your gut. And it also circulates through the bile. So it will lower the concentration there. My understanding of how de detox works is that, that there are other locations in your body that might be storing those same materials, like in your bloodstream, in your fat cells, in your kidney, liver, and skin then they have their concentrations of those. It may not be identical to what's in the gut or the bile, but they're in an equilibrium. There's like the same amount that's coming out is they're going toward each other. So if you lower the amount in the bile and the gut, then all of a sudden what's in the kidney becomes unhappy. It's like there's too much and you've broken the equilibrium. So now stuff starts coming out of the kidney and traveling toward the gut to bring it back up and you get a new equilibrium with hopefully less stuff, sure. assuming you're not bringing more in, 
Okay, so you get this new equilibrium, and then you take another dose of cholestyramine and you bring it down again, and you just keep sequentially going through this and emptying what I call the bathtub. You know, you, you, you get the junk out. Oh, it takes time, but you get it out over time. And, and I, if I may, I, I just like to offer my expert opinion. And that is that most people can tolerate cholesterol. Sometimes you need to make adjustments with it. Sometimes you have to start it slower, like way slower and bring it up. But cholesterol in the literature is by far and away the best detoxicant that is around. It's better than clays. It's better than chlorella. It's better than uh, uh, charcoal. It's, it's the best. Now, most of those studies have been done in farm animals. Cholesterol is usually five times better than, than anything else in study after study. There are a number of providers who will put people on like a, a single dose of cholesterol a day or a half dose of cholestyramine a day and maybe maybe some charcoal and maybe some stuff. I don't recommend that. And I think if you do that, you will get better. But my experience is those people often, it takes them two to three years to get better. Whereas mm -hmm. people who just start with cholestyramine get better in two to three months. I think most people want to get better fast because they, they, <laughs> they don't like being sick. Sick and tired of being sick and tired. So, so I start cholestyramine with almost everybody. Um, but again, sometimes you have to adjust it. Sometimes you have to use um, some medicines to get the bile pumping. I mean, there are just different things that you can do to do that. Eric Dorninger is the one to talk to about that. But cholestyramine is, is the way to go. It is the way to go. It's the shoemaker protocol. And the other thing I'll say about that is, you know, when I first started doing this, I actually went out to Maryland and I saw patients with Dr. Shoemaker to learn what he knew. And, and make sure he wasn't crazy or he wasn't a quack. It's true. I did it. I admit it. Okay. Um, because it, because I never learned this in, in medical school. And it's like, how can this be? But I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw my own patients that I saw, you know, that was first 15 from that high school. And I saw with him, these patients who just got better using the cholestyramine. And what he told me then, and I repeat to everybody who will listen, is one dose of cholesterol a day does not work. Two doses of cholesterol a day will probably keep you where you're at, but you probably won't get better. Three doses of cholesterol a day, you'll get better. Four doses of cholesterol a day, you'll get better faster. So that's for patients who are seeing people who don't do that. I, I'm not sure why a number of functional doctors and integrative doctors seem to be afraid of cholestyramine. It is very manageable and it is the best. There, I said it. No, it's good. Um, I said I, it. So I did the same thing when I first, I had a client that uh, was living in a basement and we did a mycotoxin urine test and everything was high. And so I didn't have as much experience with mold. I knew in our space that mold, there is mold illness. I just didn't realize how much of a big illness it is. And so I started looking at, well, what options do we have for mold illness? And there's lo lots of the binders that you mentioned, the more natural ones or the activated charcoals. And, and then I ran into shoemaker's work and, and then I just fell into this big hole and I was doing all this research and it made so much sense, but I was skeptical still. And, and that's why I went out to the SIRSX conference because I needed to see with my own eyes, the people are healing and the studies. And then I saw that. And I think it was the lady that was talking about, I can't remember her name, but she was talking about the SPMs and the OMA prem, the, how it's so good at uh, reducing like joint pain and all the studies. And then we just went, like, I can't remember her name, but I just remember specifically her saying I was so sick at one time and the SIRS protocol changed my life. And now she's standing up there I think she's 80 years old, maybe I forget, but she I heard 120. Yeah, she looks great. And she looks fantastic. And she's got tons of energy. And yes, I, I don't know her age, but I've heard that it's north of 70. Okay. So and that and and then there was um, a, someone else shared their client or patient story. And and then I became a believer. And I just tried with the small subset of my clientele having them do blood work where they trusted me blindly in a sense. 
and they all had SIRS. And then those same people are now graduating. A lot of them work with you again. And then, and then I started really openly sharing because I've seen it, I've seen it in people. And then I see it in my clients and it's the needle that is, it's not that people need a carnivore harder or they need to eat a more perfect diet it, or that they need to find a masterful way to do their um, minerals or electrolyte balance well, or that they need maybe DHA to, I mean, they might need it for a little bit, but it's not that they need to now at a certain age, they need to be injecting testosterone. It's actually that they may be surf- suffering from SIRS. And so I became a believer as well. Um, what is it about these other binders? So there's so many people on the internet saying, cholestyramine is so harsh for the body. You should be just taking activated charcoal or these other binders that are less harmful on the body and they're, they're just safer and more natural. And so a lot of people will say, I am just going to go that route. It's cheaper. It's easier. It makes more sense to me. Why is that not ideal? I, I said, I, I see people on charcoals and, and, and binders and com- combination of different binders, sure. natural things, okra pepsin and chlorella and whatnot. They do get better. It just takes them a long time, like 10 to 12 times longer than my patients. I said two to three years instead of two to three months. But if you, if you use common sense and, and dose it in a way that's patient specific, you can get past the vast majority of the problems. And most of those problems happen in the first two to three days to maybe the first two to three weeks of usage. So if you can get past that point, most people will do fine. There are some people that can't tolerate cholesterol. There are some. And those people I try on well call cholesterol. And tolerate that. And the ones that can't, I have another approach. But that approach, the purpose of that approach is to get you so that you're detoxing enough that you can tolerate something like well call or cholesterol, I mean, because they're the best and the strongest. Okay. Well, and also some of the other natural binders are the opposite charge and they're not even the same molecule size. So they may be removing, say, like a heavy metal in your body. And so your overall detox cup is less so you don't feel as many symptoms so you feel better in the moment but it may not be really grabbing on to some of the the toxins that are affected by SIRS is that correct too that is correct and cholestyramine okay. binds negatively charged ions and i assume that most biological toxins and most biological products that your body would be recognizing as abnormal have amino acids on them and a lot of charge n uh, so Cholesterol would bind all of those. And, and when I'm treating people, I'm looking at doing two things. Number one, get out of your bad building so that you don't bring more of it in. Number two, get the, the so you get the junk that's in you out of you. The faster you can do the two, those two things, the faster you get better. It's just common sense. Yeah, I've seen some people take cholestyramine even with higher cholesterol levels because it's just one marker. Now I checked is just to see if they have mm-hmm. their cholesterol, but I've seen people not be able to tolerate cholesterol just because they're still not out of a bad building. And maybe if we can talk a little bit about the importance, I know people will say, well, I remodeled our room. We remediated, we took out that part that had the mold showing, but it might not be enough. Yeah. um, Remediation is a, is a, is kind of, I don't want to say it's a crapshoot. A lot of people are able to remediate perfectly, but remediation doesn't guarantee that the building is going to be healthy for you. Right. And, you know, her, hurts me scores, Dr. Shoemaker and David Bark publish, uh, there's a 98% chance that you can reoccupy, but there's 2% of people that still can't reoccupy, even if the remediation was done perfectly. And there's always the possibility that they didn't get every water source. You know, nobody is perfect in that measure. So, and if you do it incorrectly, it, it's you're still going to get sick. In fact, if you do it incorrectly, you don't do proper containment and whatnot, you can actually make a space worse than it was before by opening up stuff that was previously contained in a wall cavity. Alternatively, um, or if you change jobs or go to a different school or whatnot, until you do that, you cannot get optimum improvement. To me, optimum improvement is is getting out of all your exposures for a period of time. 
weeks to months and staying out of them with, without recurrent hits every week when you went to Whole Foods or, or to your church or to your best friend's house or whatever, without getting those, I shouldn't have said Whole Foods, I apologize for that, without going to the grocery store. You know, and you don't, you gotta avoid hits. The most important treatment for people with this illness is to avoid recurrent hits. So that means getting rid of the problems in your own home or your workplace or getting a new workplace and not going to places that have hits. If you don't do that, you will, you, it will take you longer to get better and you won't get as better as you could have. Optimum improvement. The second part is you have to take binders. And if you can tolerate clostridium, which I'm going to tell you is well over 90% of my patients, granted with some modifications, but if you can tolerate clostridium or Wellcom, then you have, and you're in a clean space or spaces, you have now set yourself up for optimum improvement. This is the very best that you're going to get. And if you can stay there and do the clostridium for two or three months, the Wellcom for two to three, three to four months, you will get much better at least 90% of the time, at least 90% of the time. And then when we go on up the Shoemaker protocol and we go to VIP, you'll get even better, right. almost always. If people heal and graduate from the Shoemaker protocol, their immune system will go from um, attack mode to basically back to surveillance mode. And so maybe then at that point, they could have little small hits Maybe they'll notice a difference and they'll just need a little bit of the binder, but they'll go back to modulation mode. And, and I only want to bring this up if you can explain that, because I know some people will hear this and say, man, it sounds like I have SIRS, but does that mean I have to lock myself in my home for the rest of my life? I can never travel again. And I can't live a normal life because everywhere I can get exposed. Oh, well, we did that with COVID, didn't we? <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, with, with optimal treatment, you can get to a place where you can get incidental hits 15 minutes at a time or whatever and, and do fine. But that's at the end of the protocol. You have to go through the whole protocol and step one is getting out of your bad spaces or, or remediating them properly. Step two is taking the binder. There are, there are some other steps that some people do. There, there's, there's like 10 more steps, but nobody does all 10. Most people only do one, two, or three of those. Sure. And then the last one is VIP. So we talked about the immune system before, and the immune system normally is in surveillance mode in most people. And it's waiting for foreign stuff to come in. And when a particle comes in through your nose or your mouth, or even if it, it goes past those and it starts going down into your lungs, as soon as it touches the sidewall of your breathing tube or your mouth or your nose, the immune system is there to look at that particle. And it'll look at that and say, hmm, is that Judy? No, that's, that's not Judy. That's something that's foreign. And then it puts these markers around it. And those markers tell the arrest of the immune system that this is foreign and you need to destroy it. Now, if someone were to cough on you with like COVID or something like that, thousands of viral particles, God forbid, you know, coming in and all setting that off. Or if you're, if you're in a water damaged building, you might be breathing in with every breath. You might be breathing in tens or hundreds or thousands of these little minute particles that are coming in and your body recognizes are foreign. And then that ramps up your immune system and you go from surveillance mode to attack mode, okay? And you attack them until they're all gone and then VIP and MSH bring you back. And in the process of doing that, you also set up the process where you'll make antibody to those. So in the future, when you bring them in, the antibody come take care of them much faster than the innate immune system can. Remember how we said that the flu virus might take you a week or two weeks to get over it, the antibody that are effective will take care of a hit like that in a matter of hours. And so you can see the difference in, in inflammation. Right. Well, now let's say you don't make antibody because you have an HLA predisposition right. and you're breathing it in constantly. You're constantly taking yourself out of surveillance mode and staying in attack mode. And that's where the inflammation happens. Now, if you remember, I said part of the reason is because you don't have adequate VIP or MSH or both. In the Shoemaker protocol, 
First, we get you out of your bad building. Then we get the junk inside you, out of you through the binders. Then there are a series of other little systems that are caused by inflammation that we try to turn off right. if you have them. And then we get to VIP. VIP, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, is the holy grail of this therapy from the medical side. And VIP, you know, it, it turns off MMP9 production. It turns off TGF beta 1 production. It, turn, it reduces C4A. It turns off that aromatase that causes your testosterone to become estradiol. It brings things down. That's its job but you don't have enough of it or that in MSH. So by giving supplemental VIP, we can bring everything back down to normal. It takes a few months, but once you're there, it's like you're back in surveillance mode and a small hit doesn't send you to bed for two or three days. It, it does not give you license to take a job 40 hours a week in a bad building because right, right. you will relapse. If you do, and you'll probably be worse than you were before, and it'll take the same steps to bring you back. Okay. It just, so you still have to be vigilant, right? But you can live a very normal life. From my clients, some of them will say, oh, I know now when I've been in exposure, because first they'll maybe fail the vision test. Or they just don't feel well. Uh, one example that I get is now I'm, wake, um, I'm waking up in the middle of the night again, or I'm starting to have histamine issues to certain foods. And so then they go on the binder for a couple of weeks. And uh, once they're back in their safe building, they're fine again. So all of those things start improving again. And that's how they know specifically, whereas people that never heard of SIRS, they don't know that they've been um, introduced to another biotoxin. And so they're just getting sicker and sicker. And again, for some reason, their sleep's getting worse and they have no idea why. And I think that's the difference in really knowing the shoemaker protocol and then using it. Uh, once you figure out you have the HLA and the symptomology that long-term you could use it to, I guess, manage that illness, um, if you will. Absolutely. I think the people that start waking up more probably it's they're eating too many plants and not enough, you know, carnivore. What do you think about that? No, I, you know, actually, um, there, I have clients that are a full carnivore and once they do the SERS protocol, they're able to tolerate more plants than they have ever in their life. Now they choose to eat mostly meat, which that's what the goal that I try to get people is. I don't want you to eat meat just because that's the only thing you can tolerate. I would love for you to eat meat because you know, that's the most nutrient dense foods and it makes you feel your best. But this client of mine is now testing everything to see what else can I eat now that I'm now that the root cause has been serves my whole life. And she no longer gets the facial flush of histamine reactions. And she could tolerate almost every plant. She doesn't eat it all the time. But if she chooses to, she can go to a restaurant, eat the normal steak. If she wants to add like a half a cup of steamed veggies, she could do that. But she could have never done that had she not found SIRS. And she was only able to eat grass finished meats. And now she could eat anything. But it's amazing. So yes, I still believe that meat based is ideal for everybody but she can tolerate more plants just because she went through the shoemaker protocol. Sure. Yeah, I, I absolutely believe that. If, if you remember, we talked about that blood brain barrier in the brain, right? right. Well, your gut has something similar to that too, what we call tight junctions and the tight junctions in the gut are very dependent on MSH <laughs> and over 93% of our patients have a low level of MSH. So they start getting that same kind of leaky in their gut. Oh, leaky gut. Well, what happens then is your digested food molecules will start getting immunologically. They were never intended to be, and they'll set up IgE or IgG mediated antibody reactions. And we call that either food allergy or food intolerance. Right. So if you can heal the gut through carnivore or treatment of SIRS or a combination, if you can heal the gut. You should be able to, uh, Ex, uh, be able to eat foods that you weren't able to before. Right, right. And what, and this is just in my practice, which is a small s a subset of people, but I have found that every single person I've ever worked with that has ulcerative colitis has SIRS. So now when somebody comes to me and says, I have struggled with colitis my whole life or SIBO sometimes, I, I don't know, we haven't tested everybody that's come to us with SIBO because there's just many more cases of SIBO, but I suspect that one too but you see right now it's 100% of all the people we've worked with that have been willing to try and test for SIRS. 
Dopamine release can be caused by elevated C4A, mm -hmm. which we see in 80% of our surge right. patients. Yes. How much is mindset important? Because I know when people get diagnosed with SIRS, there's a subset of people that are like, yes, I finally have an answer, even though it's overwhelming. And then there's a subset that are so overwhelmed that now they feel debilitated. Like I'm scared to go out. I'm scared to do anything because now I realize, am I sick forever? Am I, do I have to deal with this illness forever? I think mindset is huge. It's absolutely huge. I mean, studies have shown that, you know, it doesn't matter what the disease is. If you have a negative outlook, if you're, if you have a victim mentality, if you are sure something's not going to work, it's not going to work. And if you have the positive attitude that I'm going to beat this, I'm going to get better, you know, and you're praying and, you know, doing all these positive kind of things and rejoicing with life, regardless of the fact that you have an illness, when you do that, uh, illness gets, it gets kind of squashed. Sure. So I, I think attitude is huge. And I told you, you know, that, that I have alternate ways of, of treating people if, if cholesterol is going to be too strong for the people that are truly very chemically sensitive, you know, people who can't tolerate a number of different uh, uh, medicines. I, I've developed an approach, you know, working with somebody else at, and it's worked for everybody except one person who had extreme uh, histamine problems. And I told her, you need to take care of your histamine problems first, and then we'll deal, you know, get that stabilized. And then you can tolerate the medicine necessary to, to treat your surge. And then I had a mother and a daughter who were insistent that it was not going to work for them. And it did. Right. So, That's but everybody good. else has been able to tolerate this, this, uh, this protocol. Okay. Everybody else. So yeah, mindset is huge. Yeah, and no. I just say if you have a negative mindset and, and you think the world's against you and, you know, this isn't fair and this isn't right, well, you might be right, but it's not helping you to heal. It's much better to have a positive outlook and know that you're going to beat something. Yeah, I, I see it from our clientele. There are people that are excited to heal and you see it and they heal rather quickly. And then there's other people that have this doomsday that we are now creating a mind body course for those people, because I need them to be in a right headspace, not live in their traumas, not live in their illnesses, and then try the path of healing because they have the hope, but it's short lived because the next day they don't feel well. And they're in that mindset in that negative loop of I'm always sick. I'm never going to get better. I'm never going to be able to go back to work. And um, it's so important. So I see it myself. You know, a lot of people think SIRS, the protocol is very expensive. How do, and some people are not in the abilities to maybe make their home foolproof and safe. How can we make this affordable so that there are people that can still get care and try to get better? Well, let me approach it first from the medical side. Um, okay. You know, if you come to my office and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, we have an expensive first uh, visit and not so expensive after that. Right. And we don't do 20 supplements and things like that. And you can go through the full SERS course without VIP for probably those two office visits and maybe another 500 to $1,000. The more expensive is, is fixing your house. Right. And you got to do it. And remediation is hard, expensive, and expensive, particularly with this inflation and, and the price of wood and everything has just gone sky high. Um, getting tested can be very expensive so that you can find where the problems are so you know where to remediate. Some people have the skills that they can remediate themselves, but then they're exposing themselves to, you know, maybe it's a spouse who can do it. It's, it is, it is expensive. I don't know a way to bring that price down unless you do it yourself or have a friend do it. And then you're not guaranteed that the work is, is appropriate. So that is a problem. The answer, the ultimate answer, maybe not for this generation is we need to build differently, right? We need to build differently with uh, materials that don't promote mold growth with water. We need to 
we need we need to teach the people that build to stop cutting corners. And I, I'm not saying that everybody does, but I've seen it so many times. I'm, I've been involved in way too many lawsuits. And oftentimes it comes from construction defects from just the way the building was built. You know, they, they have a brick facade, but they, they covered up the weep holes. And so it wasn't able to, to, uh, to drain properly. And, and inside the exterior wall, they started getting mold which then, you know, leaks into the interior or they didn't put in a water vapor barrier or they pounded a bunch of holes in the water vapor barrier. They just didn't do construction techniques correctly, which, you know, then goes to maybe they didn't, maybe their workers were not trained. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's off, you know, there, it's so, it's a, it's a systemic problem. And then the insurance industry, you know, they need to, to change. They, they've known about this illness for over 25 years. There were lawsuits in the late 1990s that they lost a lot of money on. And there, I, I haven't really seen a response from them where they're trying to educate everybody on good building practices so that you don't get sued and so people don't get sick. Instead, what I've, I've seen is they've, they've added... Um, They've, they've added riders to your policies so that they're only limited to a certain amount of liability, basically shifting the, the expense of fixing things right to the homeowner right. or the business owner instead of the insurance company. I mean, I understand from a financial reason why they would do that. I, I think they need to be in the education business and they'll get, I, I would assume if people were building better buildings and using better materials, which cost more money, um, that we would be getting better and less mold. Yeah. And, and I'm hoping that enough people will be taught about SIRS through the people and then enough people may sue. And just like how DDT used to be in some of the lawn care stuff or um, lead in our paints or asbestos in our homes, I'm hoping that eventually, and I know this will be a bigger deal to change, but if enough people are showing that they're sick and they have inflammation from um, a biotoxin illness, mostly from water damaged buildings that they will then change the code because too much uh, money is bleeding out from all of these cases. And that is the true hope because it is a never ending feat to try to live in a clean building. It's, it's, it's difficult to bring the cost down. I, I think that prevention is the ultimate answer. I, I think that this illness is completely preventable and that as more and more doctors become aware of this illness, more and more pediatricians, you can there, there you could screen an MSH relatively inexpensive, you know, yeah. 70 bucks, or you could screen HLA, you know, more like 700 bucks, not, not cheap, or you could include it on, on the newborn screening that every state does. And you could predict who the people are who are going right. to, aren't going to get it. And, and then you can make sure that the people who, have that are in a in schools that maybe are are created specifically for them as an example right. if if pediatricians knew more about this illness they could pick it up when kids are four or five years old even if they didn't do screening and they could do one-time testing to prove that they have it and the treatment at that age is super easy and then it just becomes prevention stay out of bad buildings I bring up just one other point real quick yeah. And that is, we don't make the diagnosis based on urinary mycotoxins. I know. <laughs> Go ahead, please. You I know you it. know that, but you have people watching it. Urinary mycotoxins definitely give evidence that you've been exposed, but, yeah. but there's there are no diagnostic criteria for urinary mycotoxins. It just means you've been exposed. Right. Okay, and, moving forward. Wait, wait, wait. And just to add to that. So I think it's cool to sometimes see as an extra measure if you're doing the SERS testing, but I agree. It's not definitive. And I was saying if you are with, you have no other baseline, so you show it, but is it a healthy response because you had some type of moldy food that you're now peeing out? Um, I've seen people that had SIRS that are really sick and their mycotoxin test is hundred percent clean. So is yeah. it that they're sick and they're not showing it, or is it that they're well? And that's where there is no baseline. Whereas these blood markers show what is in range. And if you're not in range, then you know that there's some type of cytokine or on with MSH as we were talking about. 
Right. And, and I know that some people use it as a diagnostic test. And it's obviously right. there are three peer reviewed published ways of making the diagnosis and all three require symptoms and the, the lab tests that, that we were talking about, you know, HLA and MMP9 and C4A and TGF beta one and things like that. So, so you, you, you can't make that diagnosis that way, just right. throwing it out there. Yeah, no, I know there's a really popular book right now in the wellness space on mold. And um, I don't think it's interesting that I, I'm it, aware of that. Book. <laughs> so I know in that book, it says, or people have shared with me that uh, certain binders go after certain mycotoxins or certain things. And it's just how, how do you delineate that? It, it, I, it makes no there, common sense. There, there is a chart out there and <laughs> you know, I don't want to say any names, but there is a chart out there that proposes uh, that uh, proposes that certain binders are better for certain yes. mycotoxins when we've already delineated that mycotoxins may or may not even show up. Right. Um, unfortunately, there are no methods that go along with that. Okay. So how did, how did we determine that? Okay. How did, did somebody do a mycotoxin test in their urine and then take a particular binder and then do another mycotoxin test? Is that how that came up? There are no methods. There's no way to evaluate that critically, which makes it unscientific. And so right away, you should throw it away. And it, it completely goes against what the peer-reviewed public literature in animals, I mean, by and far, is the best detoxicant. By and far. It's not even close. But that graph suggests that it's only good for, it was either ochratoxin A or, or yeah, aflatoxin. It's for one thing. And, and <laughs> that makes me think that it's fortuitous that the 2,000 patients that I've seen have all only had that one mycotoxin. Now, it's, it's, it's kind of silly. Right. So I, I don't put any stock in that at all because the, that is neither peer-reviewed it's, and it's not published and it doesn't have a methods. And you gotta have that to critically evaluate scientific data. You have to have all three of those and it has none of those to my knowledge. Yeah, I, I think there's some people that say they do feel better with some of these binders, but again, I think it's pulling other things. And the question is, is it going to make you feel better long-term? And that's the big question. Or are you going to need the next supplement protocol to remove again? so that you feel better for just a bit of time. And then you have to go through it all over again, or you can try this sh shoemaker protocol, get to root cause and not have to balance electrolytes, not have to balance your gut health, right? Not have to always eat a perfect diet and lots of other things that come with just using the binder, going through the, the steps in the triangle, which is really just like you said, turning off every single area that has inflammation or the cytokines releasing. And then you get to VIP and you can live a very normal life working and doing the things you enjoy rather than being stuck in the wellness space and trying to find the next big thing that may finally heal your illness, which is likely not the thing. The, the supplement of the week club. <laughs> that too. That, that's not fair. That's not, I, I know that people that practice that kind of medicine have lots of data that they evaluate and whatnot, and that's fine. I, I don't practice that kind of medicine okay. <laughs> for the most part. And I have a 90% success rate in the adults who will do those two things that I ask them to do, get out of your bad building, take the binder that I suggest, Nine, almost 90%. In children, it's almost 100%. So, and that's without any additional supplementation and whatnot. Thank you so much for this discussion. I always learn so much from you and I, I truly think you are my SIRS mentor and you can tell you're a pediatrician because you're so funny, but um, oh, just I always enjoy speaking with you. Uh, where can people find you? Are you on social media? If not, um, if you can talk about the SIRS X conference coming up and where can people work with you? Yeah. Uh, so my office is in Roswell, New Mexico. It's not hard to come here. Okay. We've seen people from 48 states and 18 countries. And uh, so, so nobody is too far away from us. You know, we've been as far away as Tokyo and, and uh, the Middle East and, and whatnot. Uh, the way to reach us is um, wwhcinfo, uh, I-N-F-O, at wholeworldhealthcare.com. SIRS X, well, uh, SIRS X is a, a website that um, provides a number of different things. We have almost a thousand different uh, print literature 
uh, articles on there that you can access for free and, and download. Uh, we have, uh, well, we're, we're, we're closing in on 300 different videos. We have a glossary. Our, our goal at SERSX is to, is to take the, this stuff that's mostly doctor stuff and break it into smaller pieces that patients and indoor environmental professionals and lawyers can understand to take things to take the environmental side and break that into pieces that doctors and patients and uh, lawyers can understand and to just break it into something that everybody can understand so you can really know what's going on with your illness. We, we, we put, we've helped put on the annual conferences with Surviving Mold where uh, and they're international conferences where speakers come all the time. I understand that Judy Cho is going to be a speaker at our next conference talking to us about some sort of diet where you eat a lot of bacon. You got to like that. But, it's, but bacon is not mandatory if you have a religious preference. But uh, so, so we have... We have the SERSX uh, Surviving Mold Conference going to be in Boulder, Colorado in July of 2023. There are going to be some courses that are uh, optional, like proficiency partners that Dr. Shoemaker teaches. Greg Weatherman's going to teach a new course uh, involved. I think it's going to be based on fogging, so something for the environmental people. So this is good for patients. It's good for, for lawyers, doctors, uh, environmental people, everybody. Okay. And the place that if you're interested in that where you get more information is at www.sirsx.com. It's going to be a great conference. And by the way, you can come in person or you can do it virtually. Hope to see everybody there. It'll be a great. Okay. No, it's good. I will put all of the information in the show notes, but thank you again for joining me today. This was so much information and I'm excited for the people that are listening and watching to hear it. Judy, I consider you a dear friend and I thank <laughs> you for having me. Well, thank you so much again. I will talk to you soon. Okay, guys, I hope that you enjoyed this interview. I hope it gives you a pause in our diet world and wellness and that maybe we don't need all these biohacks, but in reality, we are just trying to mask a more root cause illness. I hope that you consider if you have some of the symptomologies that Dr. McMahon talked about, that maybe some of it is actually SIRS. There is an easy way to just start getting tested. And the first thing is to do a vision test. And I'll put that in the show notes. But if you want to look at that, and I have a free guide that you can look at in terms of what to start doing to get tested for SIRS. I hope that you take a look at that. And I'll put that also in the show notes. While this illness can seem daunting or a lot, it actually has really moved the needle for so many carnivores to get to even further root cause healing. And if they wanted to eat something outside of the carnivore diet that they can, and that they won't have a histamine issue or an autoimmune illness flare, instead that they can still live their lives. And while being aware of mold illness and water damage buildings can be overwhelming. There are ways that you can support yourself along the journey, such as taking the binder for a little bit. The point is, I hope that all of you try to find root cause illness and healing, and that is not always serves for everyone, but I think for a large component of carnivore, it may be. What we didn't mention in the interview is that 25% of the population suffers from SIRS. And I think in the carnivore community, it's a much larger percentage. That means in the regular community, it's one of four people. I wonder if in the carnivore community, it's two of four or maybe even three of four people. It's something to think about. Okay, guys, I hope that this conversation gives you another lever to root cause healing. Make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye, guys. <laughs>